This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Yun at the Sucker Center United Methodist Church, June 16, 2019. The message is, Road Trip, U-Turn, based on Acts 9, 1-6. to All right, our scripture reading for today is from Acts 9, verses 1 through 6. Saul's conversation. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any that there who belonged to the synagogues, belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into this city, and you will be told what you must do. This is the word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you join me as I pray? Oh God, as the deer pants for water, we are longing after you. We are searching for the truth of your word. Come, O oh God, and teach us your way so that we walk in your truth and become faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So John, a 17-year-old boy, was out with his friends one night. It was Father's Day. And he realized that he had forgotten to wish his dad. Immediately he, immediately he hurried into a card shop to pick a card for his dad. However, he was disappointed to find only two Father's Day cards left. He had to pick one card and present it to his father. When opening it, his father was puzzled to see the message contained, You have been like a father to me. The son explains, well, that it was either this card or the one that said, now that I am a father too. <laughs> so, again, happy Father's Day to all the fathers and all the father-like figures in our lives, in our church. Last week, we began this new sermon series, Road Trip, thinking about our faith journey as a lifelong journey, lifelong road trip. The question was, what would be essential to this lifelong journey as we hit the road? I talked about two things that we need to make sure. First, clarifying our destination. The importance of being connected to the vision of Jesus Christ revealed in the Great Commission. Second, checking on our car. The importance of being connected to the power of the Holy Spirit. So the two things I, we talked about. Um, our Christian journey is like a lifelong road trip, as I said. It has a starting point. It entails detours, dead ends, stops, sometimes the road less traveled. Back in 2007, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. And after graduating from my seminary, I had an opportunity to travel to the Northeast. For the first time in my life, so starting from Georgia all to all the way up to New York, my, my wife, my mother-in-law, and I took a road trip, long road trip, with a map, you know, road atlas. Back then we used a uh, map atlas, right? I still remember the day when I stopped by New Jersey to fill gas. I wasn't allowed to pump my own gas. That was kind of cool. I actually loved it. <laughs> um, to visit a friend in Baltimore, we departed from New York, taking a, a Highway 95 South. It was after we spent a few days uh, in New York and Connecticut, so we were so exhausted. My wife and my mother-in-law in fell asleep in the car while I was driving, and I tried to, to be awake on the road and didn't pay attention to the map. Not realizing that I missed an exit, 
I just kept going down south for almost one more hour from our destination in Baltimore until I saw a big sign that said, Washington, D.C., five miles. <laughs> no one except me noticed it at the moment, but interestingly, the first thought that came to my mind at the time was, how should I tell them this horrible news and when? <laughs> I don't know if you have experienced a similar situation, but sometimes the hardest thing to do when you first realize that you are way off course is not to find a way out to make a U-turn, but to admit that you are headed in the wrong direction. What's harder is to admit the fact that you've got to make a U-turn. We know U-turn is always dramatic and kind of public because we travel our life journey with others. We don't want to look like a time waster. No one likes to be judged. Some people think of it even as a sign of weakness so that they beat themselves up when they decide to change track. Especially in our life journey, realizing that we are in the wrong direction is one thing and making a U-turn is another thing. There should be times when we experience U-turns in life realizing that we can always turn around no matter how far we've traveled on the wrong path. Not only has God put us on our journey, not only does God want to join us on this journey, but also sometimes God calls, directs us, I mean, he directs us to turn around and change the path from the one we have been on. Clearly, Paul was one of the biblical characters who experienced a radical U-turn in life because of Jesus. He was one of the persecutors when he was called Saul. It was not clear why he resisted the spread of the Jesus movement so fervently. As a Jew, he loved God, and for him, persecuting the followers of Jesus, cleansing those heretics might have been a way of expressing his love for God. One day he was on his way to Damascus in order to arrest Christians there and bring them to Jerusalem. But what's interesting is that on the way to his mission, he himself became one of them. This particular story is often referred to as Paul's conversion story. Some of us here may have experienced this kind of radical turnaround, but not everyone has such dramatic road to Damascus experience. There may be some of you that are at the beginning of your faith journey and still questioning what you believe or what you have to believe. No matter where you are this morning, I'd like us to take a moment and tune into your own experience. Where are you in this journey, my friends? Where are you? Is there an area in your life that Jesus is calling you to turn around? As we reflect on the story of Paul's conversion this morning, here's what we first need to clarify. It was not that Paul was converted to God through the dramatic encounter with Jesus. He was rather redirected to God through Jesus. Do you see the difference? He already knew God. He already knew who God is. He already passionate about God even though he was misguided. His love, his passion were headed toward the wrong direction and Paul used to be like a wrong way driver. He herded Christian disciples. So what happened on the road to Damascus redirected his passion for God. The experience on the road redirects his love for God. It was redirected to God's greater purpose, purpose for this world, and God's greater plan for salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul's U-turn experienced a, a radical reorientation of Paul's commitment. And this radical re, uh, reorientation of commitment is expressed in three things, which begin with alphabet B. Last, last uh, week, we talked about the words, two words that begin with C, today, B. Belief, behavior, and belonging. 
This radical orientation of Paul's recommitment is in expressed in first belief, behavior, and belonging. So first belief. Radical reorientation of commitment is revealed in transformation of our beliefs. We know changing one's belief is not easy. It's a hard thing, actually. When our most dearly held convictions, such as political opinions, religious beliefs, morals, and core principles are challenged, our brain puts up a fight to protect them. According to the science research, when deeply held beliefs of ours are called into question, a part of our brain that processes emotions kicks into high gear as if we are encountering danger, leaving us in no mood to consider a difference of opinion. And people tend to think that this is the message and the merit of the message that will transform people's belief. Don't get me wrong, it's not that I'm trying to dismiss the importance of the message or the importance of the conversations. But when it comes to our most dearly held convictions, very often it is the relationship. It is the relationship that we have to the message that matters. It's not always about the argument. On the way to destroy Christian communities in Damascus, Paul experienced a radical change in belief. And he became convinced that the crucified Jesus was the resurrected Messiah. His belief got transformed. It was the personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus through the light and the voice. It wasn't a highly sophisticated theological argument that changed his deeply held religious convictions as a Jew. When God directs us to turn around our beliefs, our convictions are transformed. And here's what Paul confesses in Philippians chapter 3, 8. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Second, a radical reorientation of commitment is revealed in the change of, first it was belief, the second, in the change of our behavior. A change in our belief is an essential part of reorientation, but that's not the whole picture. What we believe, what we believe is to shape how we live and how we act as Christians. When Stephen, one of the deacons in the early church, was stoned to death, by the angry audience. Luke introduces a young man named Saul for the first time. And this young man was ravaging the church by, I mean, entering house after house, dragging off men and women who were followers of Jesus of Nazareth and sending them to prison. Saul was one of the most fervent persecutors of, of Christ's disciples. But after his experience on his way to Damascus, he was changed man in terms of his behavior. He regained his side in Damascus, but this time he was not there to persecute the followers of Jesus, but to witness the very message he tried to get rid of from Christians. With the reorientation of his commitment, his behavior was transformed completely. Last year, in an inspiring story of Contemporary Christian musician Bart Millard of Mercy Me was produced as a movie entitled I Can Only Imagine. How many of you watched the movie? Okay, many of you. You know, the title of the movie is also his best-selling song. The title of his best-selling song, I Can Only Imagine. In this movie, the story flashes back to Bart's unhappy childhood when he was growing up with his dad, Arthur. Arthur does some pretty uh, rotten things that hurt his son, Bart. One day, Bart goes to church camp, becomes a Christian. Although he returns home spiritually renewed, he finds his mother has left home. Left with his uncaring father, the young Bart tries to earn his father's approval at all costs, especially by joining the high school football team. But during a game, the ac an accident happened and he breaks his legs. 
and is told that he can never play again. He feels frustrated because he's no longer able to make his dad happy. In the meantime, Bart makes a surprising discovery, one that he hides from his father, his singing voice. He's able to sing really well. But his father, Arthur, thinks that Bart is not good enough to fulfill his dreams. And he tells his son this, dreams don't pay the bills. Dreams don't pay the bills. He kind of frustrated Bart. But Bart pursues a career in music following his heart, following his dreams. One day, with the encouragement of the band's manager, Bart decides to return home to try to mend his relationship with his aging father. He wasn't sure whether he can really forgive his dad for all the pain that he had go through because of him. Upon returning home, however, Bart finds his father a changed man as revealed by a lack of a facial hair. When Bart discovers that Arthur has cancer, Bart changes course. Arthur has found God after terminal cancer diagnosis. He has become someone Bart never could have imagined. It has been a major life turnaround for him, like, like a Paul. Near the end of his life, Arthur offers Bart a remarkable blessing, saying, I told you not to follow your dreams, but that's only because mine never came true. As a child, Arthur's dream was to become a professional football player, but, this, but the, his dream was shattered. And he had no time for the dreams of others. Then as his time of departing, departure is coming, Arthur tells his son, Bart, that he's been saving money that could help sustain Bart while he pursues his musical career. He says, son, I want you to have that so you can pay attention to your singing. You can chase your dreams, and I want you to catch it. Don't you ever look back. You promise? We all know how hard it is to change behaviors. We all know the challenge of relapse. But when our commitment is reoriented to God, our behavior can be transformed and be guided by the power of the Holy Spirit. Going back to Paul's story, it was not the last time Paul needed to make a turn. Actually, Paul didn't always get it right from this moment on. It may not have been a 180 degree turn, but it's clear that he took several turns to follow the further direction of Jesus Christ down the road. Finally, a radical reorientation of commitment is revealed in the change of belonging or community affiliation, if you like. I talked about belief, behavior, now the community, I mean the belonging, the community affiliation. In fact, Paul was one of the most faithful Jews through and through. He was part of a Jewish religious sect called the Pharisees. Pharisees. The Pharisees represented one of the religious elites with power at that time. Paul studied Torah, the law of Moses, under a prestigious rabbi, Gamaliel, for them to keep and practice religious rituals ordered by law was the most concrete expressions of their love for God. But after his Damascus experience, Paul left the Pharisees to join the, this growing community of Jews and Gentiles who are committed to Jesus Christ. She, Paul shifted parties. And so doing however, he still remained a Jew, changing from a Jew for the Torah to a Jew for the resurrected Messiah, Jesus Christ. His community affiliation changed, and he came to belong to a community that used to be his enemy. He received support and love from this community, from this very community that he persecuted. Some of you might like traveling alone. How many of you like just traveling by yourself? Yeah, okay, which is worth doing, you know. But our Christian journey is not a solitary travel whether you like it or not. Our Christian journey is more like a group travel in nature. 
When our commitment is reoriented, we are led to belong to the body of Christ. Next, actually, uh, on June 30th, we will be welcoming three new members into our fellowship. I really invite you to come and celebrate with them as they are committing themselves to this community of faith. Becoming a member of our church means to belong to the body of Christ. It's bigger than a role that you are playing in this community. It's bigger than your preference for a certain style of worship. It's bigger than a small group you are part of at this point. It's about being part of Christ's body, serving, growing in this body together, and bearing one another in love. This is why we should continue to be connected to the body of Christ. On the way to Damascus, Jesus literally stops him in his tracks. Paul's life is changed in terms of his belief, behavior, and belonging. Jesus meets Paul on the road of despair. And friends, Jesus also wants to encounter us on our own Damascus road. If you think that you have not opened yourself fully to the presence of Jesus Christ, receive Jesus now. Invite him to your life, to your road trip, and accompany him along the journey. He will direct you in your road trip, in your life journey. What's interesting in the story of Paul is that after the event, he still went to Damascus. And this time he was directed by Jesus. His physical destination didn't change, but what was changed was who he was. This tells us about what happens when we take a U-turn in our faith journey. Taking U-turn doesn't necessarily mean that you quit your job, go to a seminary to be a pastor. Or it doesn't mean that you leave your community and family to a missionary of to foreign country. When Jesus directs us to turn around, your belief, your behavior, and your belonging changes no matter where you are located physically. Friends, as Christians, we are all on a road trip. And how had your journey been for you so far? Maybe you were once so sure of where you were going, but now you find yourself wondering, questioning. Some of you are here this morning and you're in the middle of the road to Damascus. For others, something in your life has pulled you away from faith. You end up doing what you don't want to do. Of course, you're not like Saul, who was actively working against Jesus and persecuting Christian churches but you may still be doing this passively. You, might be not, you may not be doing anything actively hurting the journey of others, but maybe some of the decisions on your path moving you away from Jesus, hurting your own journey, and diminishing your good influence on people around you and fellow Christians in our church. My brothers and sisters, if you are already on the road, I invite you to commit, recommit your lives to Jesus Christ. Open to the fullness of God's love. Reaffirm your faith. Commit to living fully as the disciples that Jesus has called you to be. Amen.